Good morning. Um, we have some things going on at Westside that I'd like to share with you. Um, we have a wonderful library, which is, I'm, I've got to get my bearing. You go out, go out this door and go uh, right, and it's right there. And we have a ton of books, and they are good books. We've got all kinds of fiction. Uh, we've got um, devotional books. We've got mysteries. We've got children's books. We've just got all kinds of books. And we'd love to share those with you. So if you like to read, you can go in and check in, check out several books. Just look around. All the fiction are on the back and to the right. Everything else is to the left. Um, there are videos. You can, there are movies to watch. Um, if you have grandkids at home, there's movies for them you can take home and watch. And all you have to do is check them out. There's a table in the library, and this lays on the table, and it says check out. This is <coughs> very technological. And on the left side, you write your first and last name. Now, I would really appreciate it because I do put these in a computer if you would uh, print your first and last name because I can't read everybody's writing. And then the books that you pick out, there will be a number on the front of the book. And if you'll just put that number, you don't have to put <coughs> the name of the book, just the number. And when you come back, there will be a line marked through that, and that means that I have put it in the computer. And there is a basket on that table. So when you return the books, all you have to do is put them in the basket. You don't have to mark anything. And we would love to share these books with you. And uh, so I hope you'll come early or stay late and go in and, and uh, check out a book. The second thing I want to announce, <coughs> um, in our church we have a, a ministry called Grief Share, and I, I know there are several churches in the area that have this program. Um, I've lost a lot of people in my life, and it's been a long time though, but I wanted to go to Grief Share just to see what the program was, and so I asked if I could, and I did. And I just fell in love with it. It, it, it was such a blessing. Um, it's a 13-week program. Uh, it's on Tuesday afternoon from 2.30 to 4.30. If you've lost anyone recently, it's wonderful for you. If you've lost anybody 20 years ago and you never grieved for them, it's good for you. My situation was... I lost my mom, and my dad had MS and was in a wheelchair, so I had no time to grieve. I had to take care of my dad. And so this has helped me go back 40 years and grieve over my mom. And you're going to grieve when you lose people. There's no way around it. If you don't grieve, you, you just are going to suffer, and you're going to hurt, and you're going to have hard memories that are good memories, but hard memories. If you grieve and go through it, it gets better. You get support from people, but most of all, you grow closer to the Lord, and that hope is renewed in you that he can give you. And a lot of people... Um, hide within themselves, uh, they stay away from people, and that's okay. They cry a lot, that's okay. We're supposed to cry. We cried in our group this morning a little bit, and it was helpful. Anyway, I've seen men and women in the group share their stories. I've seen them come in, and they couldn't say anything. For weeks they came, they couldn't say a word because they'd just start crying. And then they would smile a little bit or answer a question, and then they would finally tell their story and share good memories and look to the Lord. And 
see hope. And then they would start smiling more and laughing. And I've just seen them grow, and it's been such a blessing. So through all of that, we, uh, our grief share group just finished, and we won't start again until January. But we are going to do a special, <coughs> just a special day. It's one afternoon. It's, it's if you will, you've got your uh, notebooks or whatever and a pen. Write down November 5th, just so you'll have the date. And it's ca- this is called Surviving the Holidays. It's November 5th here at the church from 2.30 to 4.30. When you lose someone, the holidays seem to be the hardest time of the year, all of those first. But holidays are really hard. And this helps you prepare for that onslaught of emotions that, that hit you during the holidays. Um, so you'll, it's free. <coughs> you can come and you can you can come and you can participate or you can come and listen. You'll get one of these books to take home. Um, it's it's video based. It's it's Christian based, and it just gives you good ways to survive the holidays. And so I hope. Maybe you don't need to come, but maybe you know somebody that does. So if you will mention this to them, or if you'll even come with them, we'll be, we'd, we'd be glad to have anybody. And uh, so it's November 5th. That's a Saturday afternoon from 2.30 to 4.30. No, no. We're real lax with this. You just show up. We've got lots of books, and um, you don't have to pre-register. If you want to tell me that you're coming, I'll put your name down, and (coughs) we might need to order more books. I don't know. But anyway, uh, this is just a great, great thing to do before the holidays. How many of you have lost somebody close to you? (coughs) Okay. Think about yourself and think about, did I grieve like I should? You know, it's a process you have to go through. And if you don't go through it, it it really leaves you with a hole in your heart. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sure you can see Debbie after the group, and she'll be glad to answer your questions. Would you stand? And we're going to sing, For God So Loved the World. And I'm going to ask Evanel to play it all the way through for us because it may be new to some of you, but the words are very fitting for John chapter 3. Cleta, I didn't know you and I were going to sing a duet there, but in, I know that's new to some of you, but those are good words. We're going to have to sing that one again. Let's pray.
Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your only Son to earth to pay the penalty for our sins that we might spend eternity with you. Lord, thank you for your word, and I pray that as we um, uh, go over chapter 3, that you will open our eyes to the truth and that we will see Jesus and love him all the more for what he's done for us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 3. Now, this chapter gives the most complete explanation of salvation of any portion of Scripture. Some of you may remember when Jimmy Carter was president, the term born again became popular. But most people didn't have a clue as to what it meant to be born again. Well, Nicodemus certainly did not know. Now, three words describe Nicodemus, religious, ruler, and rich. Now, as a Pharisee, Nicodemus was extremely religious. The name Pharisee means separated one. And there were approximately 6,000 Pharisees who were dedicated to keeping the most minute regulations of the Old Testament law. They regarded themselves as spiritually and morally superior to other men. Nicodemus was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which is, was a group of 70 powerful men who were the Jewish Supreme Court. And as for riches, we know Nicodemus was wealthy because in John 19, we read that he brought costly spices to the tomb of Jesus. Now, a rich religious person is probably one of the most difficult people to witness to because he doesn't see himself as a sinner in need of a savior. Now, as a Pharisee, Nicodemus believed that he was already in the kingdom of God. Apparently, he was the main teacher in all of Jerusalem because in verse 10, Jesus called him the teacher of Israel. But now he's going to be taught by the master teacher. Now, we don't know why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. It could have been the only time Nicodemus could find Jesus alone for an uninterrupted conversation. Night is a symbol of an unsaved person. He is in the dark spiritually. <clears throat> now, I believe it's possible that Nicodemus was sent by the Sanhedrin to question Jesus. Because in verse 2, he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. So evidently, Nicodemus had heard about or seen some of the miracles that Jesus had performed. And he was convinced that only someone sent from God could do such things. <clears throat> now look at verse 3. Notice that Nicodemus did not ask Jesus a question. But Jesus knew what was in his heart. That he was searching for the truth. Now this is another demonstration of the deity of Jesus. Now here's Nicodemus, religious to the core... And Jesus told him he couldn't even see the kingdom of God unless he was born again. Now that must have been quite a shock to Nicodemus, who had devoted his life to keeping the law. It's as if Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you're trusting your birth as a Jew, but I'm telling you, one birth is not enough. You have to be born again. Now, this is the first time this term is used in the Bible. And in verse 7, Jesus said, You must, not should or ought to, but must be born again. Now, when the average person hears the phrase born again, he thinks it means to reform, to clean up his life, to change his ways. But born again literally means born from above. Now, all of us are born with a sin nature. And in order to enter the kingdom of God, one must receive a new nature from God. He must have a spiritual birth from above. 
Now, Nicodemus couldn't understand the spiritual birth because he didn't have the spiritual capacity to comprehend it. You see, at this point, he is spiritually dead. So in verse 4, Nicodemus asks, Well, how can a man be born when he is old? Now look at verse 5. Now there are four different views as to what is meant by born of water. <clears throat> One view is that water refers to natural, physical birth because the child in the womb is in a sack of water which breaks just before the baby is born. After all, Nicodemus was thinking in terms of a physical birth when he asked how a person could be born a second time. But Jesus was speaking of a new birth, not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And in verse 6, Jesus told Nicodemus, even if you could enter your mother's womb again, you would still be born of the flesh. There has to be a spiritual birth. Now, the second view is that water refers to water baptism and that you have to be baptized to be saved. But other scriptures make it clear that salvation is by faith alone. And if baptism were required, salvation would involve a work that we did. <clears throat> now, water baptism is part of our obedience to Christ after we are saved. It is an outward symbol to the world that we have been born again, that we are identifying ourselves as followers of Christ. So I don't agree with the view that being born of water is water baptism. Now the third view is that water refers to the act of repentance. Now unless a person repents or turns away from sin to Jesus, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, repentance brings a cleansing from sin, and water signifies spiritual cleansing. Then the fourth view is that water is the word of God. Now, there are many scriptures that refer to water as the word of God. In Romans 10, 17, Paul said, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So every one of us comes to faith in Christ by the word of God, either by hearing it or reading it. Now, why did Jesus use birth as an illustration of salvation? Well, I believe one reason is because birth produces life. John uses the word life 36 times in his gospel. The new birth gives eternal life to the one who believes in Christ. And a second reason is that just as physical birth involves two parents, the spiritual birth involves two parents, the Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God, and when the sinner believes, he receives the life of God. And the result is a new birth a child of God. And thirdly, birth involves pain. Now, I don't think there's a mother here who would deny that childbirth is painful. And our new birth caused pain to our Savior. When Jesus died for you and me on the cross, he endured excruciating pain to make it possible for us to be born again. A fourth reason is that birth makes a baby. A member of a family. Now, when you are born again, you become a member of the family of God, which Jesus refers to as the kingdom of God. Now, not all people have the right to call God Father. They can call him Creator. But to be a child of God, you must be born again. Now, in verse 8, we learn that the new birth cannot take place without the work of the Holy Spirit. No one can come to Christ unless the Spirit draws him. That's why it's so important for us to pray that the Spirit will draw lost people to him. Because only the Holy Spirit can convict us of sin. And only he can open our eyes to see the truth of the gospel. 
Now the work of the Spirit is invisible and powerful, just like the wind. We can't see it and we don't understand it, but we certainly cannot deny its results. We know that firsthand here in Greer's Ferry and Edgemont and Fairfield Bay and Clinton. Just as the powerful force of a tornado changes the landscape and changes our lives, where the Spirit works, there is evidence of a changed life. Now look at verses 9 and 10. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and he was still in the dark. He could not understand the new birth. He had head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. Now, I believe he was sincerely seeking for the truth, and he had come to the one who is the truth. I admire Nicodemus for that. You know, a lot of people are blind spiritually because they're not willing to set aside their pride and ask questions. Job said, teach me what I do not see. I like that. And Psalm 119, 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from thy law. Now when you open the word of God to study your lesson this week, ask the spirit of God to open your eyes and show you the truth, to teach you what he wants you to know. Now look at verses 11 to 21. <clears throat> where we see the key word in these verses is believe. And it is used seven times. Now this section may be divided into three parts. And in verses 11 and 12, we see the problem of unbelief. In verse 11, notice that Jesus refers to we and our. He's speaking of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you do not understand because you do not accept our testimony. You see, before a person can understand spiritual truths, he must be willing to accept them. You know, we get it backwards. We want to understand first, and then we'll decide whether we want to accept it. But that's not the way God works. He says, no. You accept it first, and then I'll give you understanding. You see, light rejected brings darkness, but light received brings more light. Now, at this point, Nicodemus does not believe, so he doesn't understand. But I believe he was born again at a later time, because in chapter 7, he rebuked the Pharisees for condemning Jesus without hearing him. And then in chapter 19, he helped Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus. So I believe at some point he was born again. Now we've seen the problem with unbelief. Now in verses 13 to 17, we see the answer to unbelief. Jesus is the only one who came from heaven to earth and then returned to heaven. Now the word ascended is only used of Jesus Christ. Now Enoch was translated. Elijah went up and the church will be caught up. Only the Lord Jesus ascended. When I went to Israel, it was over 20 years ago, our tour guide showed us a place from which Mary ascended to heaven. I don't know if they still do that. Mary did not ascend to heaven. Only the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven. Now in verse 14, Jesus is still going to teach Nicodemus the plan of redemption by the cross. Jesus refers to Numbers 21, where the Israelites had rebelled against God in the wilderness, and God judged them by sending poisonous snakes to bite them. Many of the people were suffering and dying, but Moses interceded for them. <clears throat> God told him to make a serpent of brass and put it on a pole and lift it up over the camp, and those who looked upon it would be healed. Look and live. Now, Nicodemus would have been familiar with this story. 
Let's look at three comparisons between the serpent on a pole and the cross of Christ. First, the Israelites were dying because of a serpent's bite. Man is dying from Satan's bite of sin. And second, the brass serpent was lifted up for all to see. Now, brass symbolizes judgment, and Jesus Christ experienced judgment for us when he bore all our sins and was lifted up on the cross for all to see. Now, the serpent was a reminder of the curse, and Galatians 3.13 tells us that Jesus became a curse for us. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Third, the Israelites who had been bitten were in pain and dying, but the minute they looked at the serpent, they were healed. That look was an act of faith. You see, if they didn't look, they wouldn't be healed. And you and I are healed and receive eternal life when we look in faith to Jesus Christ. Now, Nicodemus didn't realize it, but he's going to see with his own eyes the Son of Man lifted up on the cross. In verses 13 and 14, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. You see, he was not only God's Son, he was also Son of Man. He had flesh and blood. He had to have a body to be able to die as the perfect sacrifice for our sin and to shed his blood so our sins could be washed away. Now verse 15 is the first time eternal life is mentioned in John's gospel. Now when a person believes in Christ, he or she is born again and receives eternal and spiritual life. Now, the focus is not on our faith, but on Christ, who is the object of our faith. You know, I've heard a lot of people say they are people of faith, that their faith is strong, and that their faith got them through some difficulty. But faith in itself, or yourself, doesn't save. It is only faith in Christ that saves. Now, John 3.16 is probably the most quoted and best-loved verse in the Bible. People love it because it teaches the love of God. But they fail to see that it also teaches the wrath of God. Now, God is a holy and righteous God, and he hates sin. He has decreed that the penalty for sin is death. And God expressed his love to us by sending his one and only son to earth to die to pay that penalty for us. Now Jesus taught Nicodemus that God loved everyone in the world. Now the Jews knew that God loved Israel, but they couldn't believe that God also loved Gentiles, especially the Romans and sinners. So Jesus dropped a bombshell when he said God loved the world. And whoever, now that means anybody and everybody, that includes Vladimir Putin and the president of Iran and all those who want to destroy America and Israel. Now you, you may have heard unbelievers say that Christians are narrow-minded that Christianity is exclusive, but the Bible teaches that it is inclusive, that whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, the fact that some are not saved and do perish does not negate the fact that God loves them. He loves everyone, and he provided a way for everyone to be saved. God left no one out, but some have chosen to be left out. In Ezekiel 33, 11, the Lord said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their evil ways and live. And 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that God is not willing for any to perish, 
but for all to come to repentance. And 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us, God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now look at verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now there's that word, saved. Saved is another term like born again. It's ridiculed and scoffed at. Even some believers avoid using the word saved. They want a more dignified term like regeneration or reconciled or converted or spiritual experience. Now, all of these are true, but why not use saved? Jesus did. At his first coming, Jesus came to save those who would believe in him. And when he comes again, he will come to judge those who refused his offer of salvation. We've seen the problem of unbelief and the answer to unbelief. Now in verses 18 to 21, we see the results of unbelief. In verse 18a, anyone who believes in him is not condemned. You see, Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the second part of that verse, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now the basis of condemnation is not sin, but unbelief. You see, it's not all your sins that send you to hell. It's unbelief. The unpardonable sin, the only sin that sends people to hell, is unbelief. And the destiny of unbelievers is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Now in verses 19 to 21, Jesus taught Nicodemus that man's willful rejection of the light is the cause of God's condemnation. You see, rebellious man does not want to come to the light of Jesus because the light exposes his sin. And he just flat doesn't want to change. He loves the darkness of sin. So he makes a choice. He chooses condemnation. Now, people offer many excuses for not accepting Christ. Some say there are too many hypocrites in the church. I know a pastor who heard this excuse one time too many, and his response was, well, you may as well come and join us. One more hypocrite won't hurt. <laughs> so, but no matter what the excuse is, all of them come from a heart that is in rebellion against God. The ultimate reason people do not come to Christ is that they don't want to leave their life of sin. It's as plain and simple as that. Now, in verses 22 to 26, John the Baptist appears for the last time in John's Gospel. Now, after the discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the rural areas of Judea. Now, for a short time, the ministry of John the Baptist overlapped Jesus' ministry. Now, both of them had followers or disciples, large crowds following them. And both of them were baptizing their converts. Now, John 4, 2 tells us that Jesus himself was not doing the baptizing. He provided the authority, but the disciples were performing the baptisms. But John's disciples were upset that Jesus was drawing a much larger crowd. And they were afraid John was going to lose all his followers. You see, they had fallen victim to the numbers game. But John knew that he had come to prepare and clear the way for the Messiah. And now that the Messiah had come, it was time for John to get out of the way. Look at verse 27. 
John responded, no one can receive a single thing unless it's given to him from heaven. Now let me ask you something. What do you have that did not come from God? Well, you might say, well, I have my house or my car or my job or my education because I worked for those things. I earned them. But do you realize that even the ability to earn a living is a gift from God? Isaiah 26, 12 says, all that we have accomplished, you have done for us. God is the one who enabled you to work. He enabled you to read, to learn. And just the fact that you can get out of bed and get dressed and get here is by the grace of God. So John is saying that what you have was given to you by God. So why do you boast as if you have attained it for yourself? John willingly and with joy accepted Jesus' growing popularity as God's plan. So let me ask you, are you filled with joy when somebody else is being blessed by God? Now let's look at verses 28 and 29. Now John isn't, this is John the Baptist, isn't about to take any glory or acclaim to himself. John called himself the friend of the bridegroom. Now, no one expects the best man to get the attention at a wedding. The friend of the bridegroom was only an assistant. He was in charge of making everything ready for the bridegroom. So John's work was to prepare for the arrival of Jesus, who is the bridegroom. Remember when we studied Revelation, we learned that the true church, or believers, are the bride of Christ. But John the Baptist was not <clears throat> part of the bride. He is the friend of the bridegroom. You see, John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He died before Jesus' burial, death, burial, and resurrection. So he is not part of the church. But John will be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb as the best man. Now, I want you to notice two important words in verse 29. The friend of the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And as the bride of Christ, that's what we should be doing, waiting and listening for him. As we look forward to the day when we will hear his voice call us to meet him in the air at the rapture of the church, we should also be busy working for him. What a joyful day that will be. Now in verse 30, we have the principle of Christian growth. He must increase, but I must decrease. I once saw this verse taped over someone's bathroom scales. <laughs> he must become greater, I must become less. <laughs> you know, someone expressed our Christian growth like this. First, it's some of Jesus and some of me. Then it's more of Jesus and less of me. And then as we mature in our faith, it's all of Jesus and none of me. So what weight do you need to lose in order for him to increase? You know, God wants to conform us to the image of his son. He wants us to become just like Jesus. Look at verses 31 to 33. He who comes from above refers to Jesus Christ. Now, since Jesus came from heaven, he represents the Father. And to reject him is to reject the Father. Then look at verse 34. God gave Jesus the Spirit without limit. Now, all the Old Testament prophets had the Spirit for limited times and for limited purposes. But the Lord Jesus had all of the Spirit all of the time. And verse 35 tells us the Father has placed his Son in control of everything, including the eternal destiny of mankind. Look at verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Notice that it's present tense, has 
right now. Not will have, but has eternal life. You see, salvation is a gift you possess the moment you receive it. It isn't something you're going to get when you die. You already have it. It began the moment you were saved or born again. That's why I don't have to say, I hope I'll go to heaven. Because I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I know I am going to heaven because God's word says so. 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And nowhere in the Bible do we read of anyone being saved twice. A birth happens only one time in the physical realm and only once in the spiritual realm. Now look at the last part of verse 36. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. If you reject the love of God expressed through his Son, Jesus Christ, then you must suffer the wrath of God. In fact, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you are already under the wrath of God. Now you have only two options, to trust in the Son or reject the Son. The decision you make concerning Jesus Christ determines your eternal destiny. So what choice have you made? Have you been born again? Have you celebrated your second birth day? I pray that you have. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word that you have made it so clear to us how we can spend eternity with you in heaven. Lord, I pray if there is anyone who has heard my voice today who has not acknowledged that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to draw them with cords of love so strong that they cannot resist, that you will open their eyes to see the truth of the gospel, that you will bring them to repentance and to saving faith in Jesus Christ, that they too might know that they will spend eternity with you in heaven. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.